So Nandi Bhatti is a professor in the Department of English and Writing Studies at Western and is currently the Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Her research interests include colonial and post-colonial literature theory, uh, British India, and the 1947 partition of India, diasporic literatures and theater. And Nandi was a perfect uh, uh, person to be hosting the conversation that you're going to hear parts of. Ruth Skinner, who you met yesterday, if you didn't know her already, I don't know why you wouldn't, but um, you haven't been around London much. Um, anyway, Ruth uh, works as an arts organizer, researcher, curator, publisher, and educator here in London and well beyond. She's an instructor at Western, Lakehead, and Fanshawe College, and her current doctoral research um, encompasses experimental publishing practices, artist books, forensics, and clairvoyance. So with that, I'm, I hope I haven't left anything out, um, but I'm going to turn it over to Ru Ruth and the group. And actually, if the group want to come and sit up here, that's our sort of style for getting people up to talk about their work. Thanks. Ooh. I'm sure I don't know everyone, but I'd like to. <laughs> uh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and it's a, a total honor and delight for me to assist Nandi in co-hosting. And uh, I have to shout out Tom Call for your very convivial co-hosting or hosting yesterday. So I'm going to do my best to do due diligence to your uh, capacities as a entertaining host. Um, so I, uh, I am going to begin, we're going to begin the way this will run. Uh, Nandi's prepared a video for us, so we are going to watch that. It was such a pleasure for me to participate, to, to listen into your conversation, uh, which appears as a transcribed conversation in the catalog. So you'll be able to hear some of Nandi's thinking when she was approached to, to consider and contextualize these two very huge themes, women, and colonization for us. And following that, I'll be introducing each of the panelists one by one. I'll give a brief biography, and then each panelist will be invited up here to speak for a couple of minutes, and then uh, we will all uh, organize on the stage for a series of questions, which you were given in advance. And then we'll open it up to the audience. So maybe we will go ahead to Nandi's video, if that's OK. Hello, I'm Nandi Bhatia, and I should say at the outset that I'm very grateful to Patrick Mann and Jeff Thomas for inviting me for the panel on women and colonization. I feel honored to be a part of this gathering, and I'm so sorry that I'm not there in person, so it's my thing to miss. This panel builds on a roundtable conversation with Jamili Hassan, Sarmishta Kar, Katie Willem, and Jessica Karlonga that took place following Patrick and Jeff's co-curated exhibition on gardening and state in London, Ontario in 2021. One of the key messages that emerged from the exhibition was the articulation of multiple perspectives and responses to colonialism and decolonization, specifically in relation to themes of home, separation, partitions, displacement, treaties, solidarities, and reconciliation. This panel hopes to expand the dialogue of how artists articulate the relationship between women and colonization. My own entry point in this conversation began through colonial and post-colonial literature, where gardens, parks, farmsteads, and land have been assigned various symbolic meanings and connotations. They appear as spaces of labor economies that worked in the interest of the empire spaces that generated environmental concerns in plantation economies and imperial spaces in colonial homes. Paradoxically, they are represented as spaces that enable solidarity, camaraderie, friendships, community building, and environmental and economic self-empowerment. A couple of examples of novels 
that deal with moments of decolonization and of life under colonial economies stand out. So I'll give you these two examples. The first is Bapsi Sidba's Tracking India, which is a story about the traumatic effects of the 1947 partition on families, individuals, and communities with the splitting of the subcontinent into two nations, India and Pakistan, when India attained independence from centuries of British colonial rule. Set in Lahore and told from the perspective of an eight-year-old girl named Lenny, a large part of the action takes place in Queen's Park, where Lenny and her caretaker, Aya, spend a lot of time with Aya's friends and admirers from different religious groups. With the cataclysmic shifts caused by partition, Lenny registers the changing landscape of Queen's Park as desolate when she witnesses invisible walls that start dividing communities who begin to stick to their own. <coughs> Soon, Queen Victoria's statue also disappears, evoking the symbolic disappearance of the Raj that held its authority over the subcontinent for several centuries. Thus, Queen's Park becomes a dynamic space that records the debilitating consequences of forced migration and its attendant loss of people, villages, and property. My second example is, is uh, Zimbabwean author Titsi Dengarengba's novel, Nervous Conditions, in which Tambudzai, a young girl growing up in 1960s colonial Rhodesia, has a desire to attend school. When a brother is sent to school because there's not enough money in the family to send both children, Tembu decides to raise money for a school fees by growing maize or mealies on a plot of land that she cultivates based on knowledge inherited from her grandmother with whom she had worked in a garden. With the aid of Mr. Matimba, the Sunday school teacher, Tembu sells her mealies to a white woman and raises enough money to pay for her school fees. While this story tells the reader about Tembu's spirited initiative, through which she secures educational self-empowerment and sustenance by drawing on lessons learned in her grandmother's garden, it is simultaneously a story about the power of gardens and how they come to be entangled with the politics of race, class, and gender in the colonial economy of Rhodesia. And I should just add that I was in Silet, Bangladesh for a conference last week and visited a 700-acre tea garden that was started in, 19, in 1880 by the British. We had the opportunity to walk around and enjoy the lush beauty of the gardens, visit the manager's home, and also some families who work in the gardens. Women constitute most of the workforce, even though they don't own the land. I thought about many connections to the theme of the gardenship project and this round table. Silet has many tea gardens, and my colleagues spoke about the several narratives that record stories about these gardens. So given the articulation of such issues in literature, this panel hopes to open up new conversations on, theme, on the theme of women and colonialism from each of the artists' perspective. And I uh, hope to catch up on the round table later. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Nandi for that really rich um, and vibrant contextualization of some of the concerns that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and thanks, Chuck, for keeping us on track. So it is an absolute pleasure to be able to be joined by Jamili Hassan, Katie Wilhelm, Sharmis Dakar, and Jessica Karahanga for this panel, all four of whom have made such important contributions as artists, but also uh, to many, many different communities, both locally and further afield, have made so many important contributions as educators, as activists, as mentors, and as supporters of their communities. And so I'm going to invite each of you up here one by one to speak for about five minutes on your practice. We're gonna begin with Jamili Hassan. Jamili Hassan is a visual artist who is also a social justice activist and independent curator. She has organized both national and international programs and her work is represented in numerous public collections in Canada and internationally. 
With Ron Benner, she is the co-founder and curatorial advisor of the Embassy Cultural House, a community-based cultural collective and not-for-profit in London. Please, Jamili. Good morning, um, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, this whole situation, for all of us to gather. It's absolutely incredible. And it's been um, a really amazing, like I'm having a deja vu right now. It's completely strange. Ruth, did you your clairvoyance? <laughs> um, but um, I think you all know what a deja vu is, and I think some brain specialists say that it's something to do with the way the brain takes in emotion and, and moves thought, emotion, and concepts together and kind of gets confused. Um, and so I was talking um, earlier um, this morning about how to speak today um, and with all of you that have had the pleasure to get to know many of you are good friends. Um, working together with you has just been a really great experience. And of course, the whole uh, welcoming, um, the smudge, uh, that brings us all together in this extraordinary circumstance, um, something that is so historic, I think. Like, I think in, in truly that what we are going through right now is something that all of us um, will carry with us for, forward indefinite. I mean, it's just unending in terms of the way that we will relate to this period of the last three years. Um, so we're actually at that three-year point, um, and it's kind of remarkable that we are here to do this, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And I'm very grateful for the acknowledgments. Um, like the way that Anne and Mary Lou do this, <laughs> um, the thank yous, the gratitude, this is uh, very much a part of where I see uh, the decolonial project happening that it's a very, uh, we, we start with ourselves, we start within ourselves. Um, we situate our position in a manner in which we have to question um, all aspects of, our re of how we relate to each other. And that relationship is, um, for me right now, um, I'm speaking as a grandmother. And during the um, discussion, our panel, I sort of took that as a kind of special space because Roberta Jameson, in an interview, had said that her most imp the most important role for her was her role as a grandmother. Um, there were all these other really significant political, cultural roles that she had had, but how to pass on to the next generation, and particularly in relation to your own intimate context, um, the obligation and the responsibility that that entails. And so I wanted to just tell you a little story about my relationship to my grandmother. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> there, well, here's Mary Lou. She's always carrying with her her handwork. She is working away here beside us. <laughs> and um, I was a really terrible person, like in terms of doing sewing and knitting and all of that. I couldn't do it, but I could design. I could make images when I was very, very young. And uh, so, but one of the things that we had to do was that we had to go to home economics. Many of you will remember that. I wanted to go to shop, to the shop with, where you got, your, got into building things. And, um, but that wasn't allowed for girls to go to shop classes. Girls had to go to home economics. Um, many years later, that changed, and my son actually wanted to go to home economics rather than shop. So I think that's really great. Um, but um, one of the things that we learned to do in our family of 11 children was to mend. You mended, you repaired, you restored. And, you, and one of the things that I really love doing still today is mending my socks or... <laughs> Ron sucks. <laughs> um, and there's something about like our context, the frugality, the way that we try to minimize like the whole kind of material consumption context that is sh constantly shoved at us. 
So I think in, in, there's a lot of dilemmas for artists right now. Um, and one of them obviously is the context of how do we survive to continue to do the cultural work that we love to do and stay uh, connected. And so very fortunately, I think that many of us have had this community in so many different ways that have intersected and interconnected in, in, in really you know, profound contexts. So I'm very uh, aware of that in terms of the way that I do my work. And one of the things that um, uh, we were talking about is the idea of making the, the project and, and how does it all come together in a, in a certain with, from all these different perspectives, and how do we how do we make that have a language of its own? And when we think about the way that we take on the responsibility of acknowledgments and land acknowledgments and discussions about that, and how Mary Lou asked us to sing the song and bring breathe and bring into our language indigenous sounds and languages, as we bring in like. Um, you know, something like raison d'être en français, you know, and how we bring in, drop in different words from different languages that we, we recognize that language is a transforming kind of context for us. So that has been something that I've worked with over a number of years, um, my relationship to different languages, my broken Arabic, um, but a context where I do understand and can work with Arabic, but at the same time, it's not, a, it's not the only defining context for me, um, that broadening that relationship to communicating in different ways. Um, and so some of the work that I created for this exhibition had to do with my relationship to language and, of course, um, my context and relationship to this idea of youth and how young people are driving us to, to recognize the obligation that we have um, to continue to care, to be uh, not owners of, but uh, protectors. And uh, in many ways, some of the projects that have been done are about that within the Gardenship Project. And so this bringing together the subject and, and subject position, some of the things that Lewis talked about yesterday in the keynote, I, I think are very significant that we have to start within ourselves to decolonize what are the things that are constraining us? How do we dismantle the very limiting structures that uh, surround us and challenge those structures in a way that is productive and make and build uh, from within our own communities? I don't think it's about um, for me, I mean, I travel extensively. I did in the past. I don't know how much travel I'm going to be able to do um, in the future because now we have uh, two young, very young, five-month-old twins, and I want to be close to those two um, in a very specific way, um, in the way that I was for our 19-year-old grandson. So the intergenerational that we talk about within the Embassy Culture House is very much a part of the way that we um, are reflecting on our own life experiences. And I'm just really delighted to be here. And uh, yesterday was extremely uh, inspiring. And there's so many of you here who have contributed in so many ways in your own practice, within the collective, within the institution, that we can move forward. I'm, I'm very confident in that possibility. And I get a lot of very uh, emotional kind of sense of things. So I'm going to stop right here and let Ruth introduce the next wonderful artist. Thank you, Kimberly. Katie Wilhelm is an award-winning designer and marketing consultant. And of course, Katie Wilhelm took the lead in designing both the catalog for the Gardenship and State Project, as well as the almanac that you are all welcomed to enjoy this weekend. Katie use, utilizes art and design to connect the community, revitalize spaces, and create knowledge sharing opportunities. She is a proud member of the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation, at Nyashingiming, I did not say that well, thank, thank you, uh, with Canadian settler heritage. And it's my pleasure to invite you up right now. 
Thank you. Miigwech. Ani. To all my relatives and elders here today, uh, I'm honored. Honored to be a part of the uh, Guardianship and State community and uh, to be coming to you today to share some of my work in the whole, the whole thing. So I guess first, um, I, I should mention I'm from the Chippewas of Naywash First Nation. Uh, this is Bruce Peninsula area and, and we are the uh, ones responsible for caretakers of that watershed and caretakers of that land. Um, decolonizing spaces is so important to me because it, I, for me, it means the survival of our species. Uh, it means thinking about uh, seven generations from now, the way that individuals living on this land seven generations ago thought about us, thought about us having confluences here at Deshkinzibi. So very powerful also to be here today in this safe space to have these discussions with everybody. Um, also, it's amazing for me to be here speaking to you as an artist. I practice professionally as a designer and consultant. Uh, so coming today as an artist is an amazing full circle moment because I was actually kicked out of art class in grade nine. Uh, <laughs> right? I didn't want to follow the directive. I still don't want to follow the directive. <laughs> So the, uh, let's talk about my work with the uh, Gardenship and State Print Publications. So it all really started with the journal. I'm so happy to see Joan Greer on camera. Uh, part, she was part of the group that called, became to be called Cross Pollinators. The, cr the group of Cross Pollinators, a group within the uh, Gardenship and State Collective, led the creation of the Gardenship and State Journal. The journal is meant to be a complement to the exhibition and it's meant to be a prompt and a guidebook to those wondering, what's next? What's the future state? So in, in making that journal, it really shaped all of the themes and it shaped all of the directions that would be carried through into the catalog and then the almanac. So these three pieces are kind of the whole uh, print collective, I suppose, of the Gardenship and State journey over the last three years. If we could go to the next slide. In part of producing this work, a little symbol came to be. Uh, this little symbol was created through the conversations uh, on Zoom with people all over, <laughs> with those cross-pollinators. And uh, this is called the bead. It is a bee, it is a bead. Uh, it represents to me the action, it's the prompt. In the journal, whenever the bead appears, this is when it's, oh, it's my turn now to speak. We know listening is so important, right? Uh, the bead also appears in the catalog as this uh, is just a disruptor. It's meant to disrupt you in the reading of the text. It's meant to be a, a prompt and a call to action. The actual symbol references the Tura Wampum, the, the theme that uh, Jeff Thomas brought to, the, brought to the discussion and really, really uh, sat with me that this theme needs to be so present in all of the printed publications as the goal of these publications is to tell the story of gardenship, which is a very big story to tell. So that's why the catalog is 300 pages. And that's why we needed two other pieces to complement it, right? So uh, the bead, I hope, um, I hope people can identify with it. Um, and maybe wh what is your part in the two row wampum tapestry? Where does your little bead sit? Um, these beads in the publication, they, they take formation to create kind of a beaded pattern, but they break formation. I think that that's, that's really important too. Okay, and the next slide. Uh, in our discussion, the women and colonization discussion, um, I referenced this piece here that I had installed at the Grand Theater, or that they commissioned to have installed that I worked with, um, with my amazing collaborator, uh, Summer Brissett. And this piece is about land back. It's that story. Uh, so I think this was installed probably two years ago. And this was right when we were discovering the, the bodies. And so the, the messaging at that time was very land back. And it started to kind of take on a, uh, its own kind of uh, meaning and lost meaning. I think in some of the messaging. So we wanted to bring that back to 
um, land back, what does it really mean? Giving the stewardship of the land back to the people. Chippewas of the Nawash were unseated, and we take that responsibility very seriously, and we want that responsibility. So I feel that it should be given back. Um, but with that, also our stories back and our culture back. Blank back, what else are you going to give back? <laughs> That's what this piece means. And just to honor uh, Summer and to honor the piece, I'm going to read the artist's statement here. So Summer says, storytelling is ceremony and each time we share the universe inside of us, we become part of the collective dreaming around us. This artwork is titled Mush Hole. Um, M-U-S-H-W-H-O-L-E. It's a play on words with the mush hole um, referencing the, uh, the Mount Elgin Industrial, or Mount Elgin, uh, yeah, Industrial School, it was called, the residential school. So this being a place of disconnection and the word whole in reference to healing and being reconnected to the land, language, and self, right? Art is healing. Uh, this piece asks the question of the viewer through the eyes of the faceless stolen children. The background holds imagery of the cold building against the freedom of the dancing ribbon skirt wearer, and the message plastered in a post no bill style echoes back to the calls from Indigenous people, almost lost in the noise. So the text areas hold this region's contrived land acknowledgement. It occupies the areas, or the water areas of a map of Turtle Island, where east is north, and in some Indigenous maps, the, the land is actually gone. So this piece being hung at the stairwell as you go up uh, into the Grand Theater with all of these feathers kind of hanging, the idea is to be an affront to your senses <laughs> and really to think about all of these uh, lost lives, sure, and what you can give back, sure. Um, but I think that this piece is, is a stepping stone, at least in my artistic journey and maybe in our all, all of our truth and reconciliation journeys to Re rec truth and reconcile with this, of course, but a step sing stone to move forward. And I think what I'm going to talk about as we get into the, the panel discussion is uh, where my work is headed these days, and that's the stories of Indigenous joy. More laughter, more taking up space, more space for art. Miigwech. Thank you, Katie. Charmisa Carr is an artist from, oh, you look stunned. You're on a panel. Charmisa <laughs> uh, Carr is an artist from Kolkata, West Bengal, India, and is currently pursuing her MA in art education at Concordia University. Can't wait for you to be back here, though. In her work, Carr employs traditional and contemporary adaptations of embroidery, to explore mapping migration and identity. So please welcome Sharmista Carr. I'm very happy to be back here after maybe seven months, and I always miss and I look forward to any opportunities and chances to be here. Yeah, I feel home here in Canada, <laughs> beyond India. So uh, thank you, everybody. and. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be part of this project and it's like a great learning process for me. And, and I see my practice is like uh, every work is for a lesson, like uh, I do learn and I feel all of us do that in some way when you create something. Um, so I did uh, mainly three artwork for this uh, guardianship and state project and uh, learned a lot from all the speakers and artist in this group. So three of the work I kind of uh, intended to focus uh, three part where um, I focused on the like the colonial history and I kind of acknowledged uh, that part through a work of art, uh, kind of an um, indigenous form of art in Calcutta. And that was, uh, can you go to the next slide or do we have any, uh, any Another one? Is there? Okay, that's fine. Uh, so there is uh, one work where uh, I did a hand embroidery, a small piece, and it talks and shows uh, like um, a group of uh, Britishers traveling on a boat, 
and that was documented by uh, Kaligat painting uh, from Calcutta. Uh, yes, this is the work, that's fine, yeah. And uh, I just felt like that is a very interesting image, uh, and they uh, documented it through a painting, and which was basically sold uh, in front of a temple as a piece that people can collect. And uh, I did that piece, uh, and I showed it from the back, which is very blur, not a very good looking uh, image. But I was just trying to question the whole idea of how much we uh, still acknowledge or struggling with the whole past that we had lived. And uh, those people who already painted, how much uh, observation or lived experience they portrayed in those artwork. Were they uh, very conscious about, uh, like, it, I feel it is a kind of a documentation or archive they did passively, like what was happening around at that time. And that was my triggering point to choose that part, uh, that image uh, from Kaligat painting. And then second work I did, uh, uh, which is a collaborative work, uh, and it's a, a tent-shaped piece, and it is again on hand embroidery, and I kind of collaborated with uh, some of my friends that I met here uh, in, uh, in London, mostly at Western universities, and, uh, and I, I requested some of them who are from Peru, uh, Mexico, uh, uh, Syria, and uh, India, that to reflect on two words I asked them, uh, home and land, and I just told them, don't think a lot, but just immediate response. And, some of them gave uh, a lot of words that they felt when they met their families and read through some literature. And I kind of tried to portray the same uh, response, and uh, it's mostly handwritten. And that's the work in the center. So I was kind of uh, trying to see when we are in a different land and different purposes, like it was probably not um, a forced migration, but a chosen one uh, for many of us here. And just wanted to see what we think when we are living a different life, which we chose beyond that homeland that we grew up. Uh, so that was the second piece. And the blue one, the tent, I thought of again uh, the kind of an Anthropocene idea where human and nature, like the nature culture uh, that is com coming together and we are kind of passively affecting or being part of that whole activity and how temporary or fragile is our uh, relation with the nature and we still kind of try to hold on to that and develop it or trying to make the place better. So I chose a tarpaulin and make a shape of a tent on it and I chose a particular embroidery technique from Japan called Banka, uh, which is uh, in North India. It came, I think, after World War II, and it's punch needle here. It's very popular. Um, and then I kind of make it like an interactive one just to um, give an experience to the viewer uh, of that fragile uh, relation with nature and human. And then uh, I kind of uh, invited them to pull a uh, part of thread and have that feeling uh, of uh, undoing the shape or the form of a tent, uh, which I, I kind of relate with a, like a temporary presence um, or in transition uh, from place between two places. So it's it was very different when I talked some of the people who interacted and uh, some of them also hesitated and they left in between pulling the thread away and they left the whole long thread there. They just felt like they are destroying the work. <laughs> but um, it was, uh, I felt like it's a lot when I am creating the form in my studio and then it is traveling from there to the museum or the place that it's being displayed and then that small thread they're carrying to their home. So I was uh, kind of interested in that whole connection or the mapping idea from home to the home and that whole invisible mapping that is happening uh, through that small piece of thread. And 
uh, and they are also passively becoming part of that whole experience of making the form and then dismantling or slowly um, disappearing from the surface, remaining, uh, keeping those holes on the tarpaulin. And that was uh, kind of effective in many ways, but I didn't want to make them feel odd <laughs> that they're de destroying the work, but I just wanted to have that fragile feeling of having a space in this world or in, in our current society. So that was pretty quick, I think, about those three work. I hope I saved some time for the next speaker. <laughs> yeah. And we are hoping for the next speaker. Thank you, Sharmisa. Jessica Karahenga is an African-Canadian artist who works through writing, video, drawing, and performance. She is currently an assistant professor in studio arts at Western University. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's so, I'm trying not to get distracted by this book. It's so, um, I still get very excited when um, I, I'm ever featured in a publication thing. I used to write a lot of books as a child, so this is always very affirming. Um, it was really nice to hear from, lovely to hear from my future co-panelists. Um, I was thinking about a few things, um, about uh, what Katie said about the bee, bead being this disruptor, and something that Jamili said about points of relationality, because that's kind of how I like to approach or think of how I relate to all other beings, um, how they live in the world. And um, I also like to approach kind of relationship dynamics, um, kind of meeting them um, where they're at. And that helps me as a teacher. It helps me as a sibling. It helps me as a family member. Um, and sometimes that can start with a question of, um, origin, um, how, how did you arrive here now? And so in my context, um, that comes from thinking about place. Um, I'm first generation Ugandan on my dad's side. My mom, he's a refugee from Uganda. My mom is of mixed British Romani heritage. Um, and when I think of these origins, I think of a kind of rootlessness. And so in my art practice, I often start with my own body. Um, with the understanding, especially because I work a lot with the image of the black body, the black female form in my work, um, with the understanding that invariably um, non-black folks, non-African folks are gonna interpret or read those images in a kind of um, particular way, a way of um, othering, a way outside of themselves. And I think that kind of connects in a way to embodiment and, and the impossibility or ways in which we try to um, stretch out these empathetic capacities. Um, so in terms of my relationship to this show, uh, I kind of arrived a little bit later into the project and Jeff and Patrick had reached out to me asking for, um, a work that I had already made that had been, um, part of Nuit Blanche in Toronto and a show at Onsite. And, um, that work in some ways, and a lot of ways, connects to the image you see here. It's um, Alam, who's um, a dear friend of mine and a collaborator who's featured in the image there, was part of this installation. Um, it's a two-channel installation where there's these two black femmes um, kind of moving intuitively in the wilderness. And I was thinking of, you know, these constructs of the Canadian landscape and regionalism and... Um, and how to kind of disrupt the kind of cultural expert you see on um, postcards as the product of so-called Canada, right? Um, and the kind of absented, what Catherine McKidrick has called the absented presence of um, blackness in, this, in these images, um, considering where we um, come from. So uh, that piece has already be, um, planned to be part of another show that was here at Museum London. So we began discussing discussions about making a new work. So um, a lot of uh, gardenship took place during um, the beginnings of this pandemic um, with various lockdowns, a virus that assaulted our lungs, our breathing breath took on very, a lot of poetic um, charged meaning um, for 
for um, black subjects during that time. So I was just thinking about what it feels like to deal with this kind of intense grief and re-traumatization through circula circulation of these images and what the isolation does to your spirit when you're not able to commune with your people. And, you know, as an African person community, <laughs> getting together is just very, very important in terms of healing, thriving, um, positivity, and what happens when you can't have that. Um, and I was inspired by a lot of um, African cinema, too. Um, so this piece kind of came out of that. And I think it's important that Alam and I had this, Alam and I had this friendship and trust where I could kind of record her with these short focal lengths and intimate scenes. And so what you have is a series of these kind of single frame shots, these very long takes. Um, and as you walk around the screen, it kind of shifts these different scenes. And she goes through these various movements, sometimes doing these banal everyday tasks. Um, you know, I, I was inspired by um, films by Julie Dash, um, literature like Alice Walker, even films by Sh um, Chantal Ackerman. So um, that's kind of how this piece goes around. Um, something that we'll probably get to talking about in here, but also riffing off of some of the things other folks were doing around mapping, um, undoing, decolo decolonization. I think sometimes that word gets kind of um, misinterpreted, just simply labeled as being a kind of undoing. And I like to think of it more as an unraveling. I also like to think of this, um, this phrase I read somewhere, I'm pretty sure it's Angela Davis. I really wish I had looked this up beforehand, but um, it goes along some, something along the lines of radical simply means grasping at the root. Um, so when I think of the rhizome or getting down to that place um, of, a, of kind of to arrive at a type of understanding or an honest, authentic relationality to one another, I think that is a starting place. And I just was really touched by how much I was sort of welcomed into this um, community that formed through this uh, project. And I think it's very, very important that there is um, an archive documenting all that work. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. So I'll invite you to the stage, please. And we'll have about a half hour panel discussion with some pre-prepared questions, but also some time to open it up to the audience. So choose your chairs. <laughs> Thank you so much. So there are four pretty expansive questions. We'll kind of pay attention to time. You are not obligated to answer every single question, but I'll open it up to you and let you take the lead. Uh, so the first question you were asked to consider, uh, how do you envision your work in response to the themes that were raised? So women, colonization, decolonization, gardens, gardenship, et cetera. Uh, how do you envision your work in response to those themes and or as a way of enlarging on how we might think about them? So would anybody want to try to, to engage that first? <laughs> Just need a moment. I have sure. to admit that I didn't look at the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Me either. But I actually, as, as you said that, I was like, I'm going to just go for my emails quickly. And then, <laughs> so I did, re I have read them now. Um, yeah, yeah, but I, I'm, hap I'm still going to participate, obviously. We're, we're here. The point of no return. <laughs> um, I, I guess to answer the question, uh, I, I saw my work, uh, particularly the, the mural, you see, as a in the whole theme of decolonization as um, a work of kinship and collaboration. I think so often um, we're competing with each other 
uh, yesterday there was some conversations about radical forgiveness that I really, really liked. And I liked the idea of, um, in the spirit of the two row wampum, and as Jeff was saying yesterday, I'm all over the place, uh, that, that he was inspired by seeing a butterfly and dragonfly uh, almost talking to each other, kind of side by side, these two enemies side by side. And it reminded him of the two row wampum. And it reminded me of our discussions here today and having very decolonial discussions in a very colonially put together project and environment. Uh, so it reminds me of Stockholm Syndrome in a way um, that were led by the oppressed out of these systems of oppression we don't even often see all the wires for. So brings me back to collaboration and kinship with each other and in these really uh, hard discussions, not trying to uh, have competing views with others who may think differently than us, but thinking about how we can travel together down the river in our canoes. Um, I, I really love what you're saying there. Um, when I think about um, authentically kind of showing up and that willingness to have a conversation or kind of collaboration, um, I think part of that is also like acknowledging, you know, um, different points of relationality and power dynamics. I think about that um, in terms of like my own practice. So, you know, I I might create this sort of artwork and a lot of my work can be quite autobiographical or it starts from that point. And so when I bring other um, black women, um, gender nonconforming, non-binary folk into my work, you know, there's a part of me that also wants to protect and care for these people as my siblings, honorary siblings in the world. So, um, you know, that involves um, the labor or work of like um, checking in with one another um, about, you know, if the terms of those dynamics like change and how to how do you construct this thing together. So that that to me is really important is just also making sure that I have the capacity and I am well and healthy to be able to show up that way for themselves. And I also think of, um, I remember, uh, I remember, uh, uh, hearing, uh, going to this lecture and, um, and, uh, the philosopher, uh, Fred Moten saying, um, that we have to, it's important that we imagine, um, new habits of assembly. And I, and I think that's very, powerful in terms of thinking about this like apex we are in in the world right now right um and it also makes it less about the production or representation of you know like it's one thing when you see like an image of like huge crowds doing i just feel like sometimes the work happens in other ways because like you know sometimes disability access all these things can mean you can't like show up in the way that is like the expectation or stereotype, but I think there's other ways in which we kind of, there's many ways in which we can kind of do the work that may be less colorful or vibrant or like pretty to like look at. So, um, these are things that I'm constantly checking in with me. Like what, what is beyond my periphery? Who am I not seeing or thinking of? Um, and I open being checked on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think those are really both very significant ways of, of presenting for both of what you have said. And I think uh, yesterday, Ruth, you were talking about radical artifact and that reference. And I was thinking, thinking very, you know, the term radical and how do we position that in terms of our practice and how do we, how do we make um, that movement happen and change happen and go forward. And many people were talking yesterday about digging down and that kind of sense that you're excavating, you're shifting, you're recognizing that um, it's work and that kind of work is collaborative and collective. And I think this is a huge challenge. I mean, given I, I mentioned very briefly the enormous pressure that are, is on people in terms of materialism, like the insane notion of consumption. So I'm struggling right now with where are artists positioning themselves as object makers. And so like when we talk about the fact that gatherings also represent a mode of creativity, that the gathering together, dialoguing together and recognizing that we're not in competition with each other, that we're actually better off 
without that in our lives. That, that is such a negative strain that has been so heavily put upon us to perform in a certain way that demands us to be new, 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 and not go back and think about our history and to recognize that we wouldn't be where we're at in, on, on the good side of things if we didn't recognize those benefits and also recognize the harm that has been done on the other side of things. So we, that question around acknowledgement, like there's been huge debates and disagreements about land acknowledgement. Well, for us, you know, our connection to where we are, we need to recognize that it is different than when Dan and Mary Lou speak or when Katie speaks. We need to recognize, yeah, that's different. Um, but their, their relationship to Indigenous peoples in the world is like building that connection. So if you're, for instance, there was a period when people talked about nomads. Remember that? Like that term kind of floated around all over the place. Well, in the Arab world, there genuinely are people who are nomadic, not just in the Middle East, but in other parts of China or Asia. The term, the way we use our language, the way we think about it, is, is very important and it represents a shift. And so I don't think we say nomad in the same way anymore. And you know, there are a lot of cultural studies, you know, specialists and professors who were just, you know, throwing it around all the time and I would get really upset about it. Um, and so I certainly do understand how we need to um, allow for the changes in our language that reflect the changing in our relationships and that we say, okay, no more of that. Okay, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, it's okay for me to just say, I step back. I don't need to prove myself to anyone. I'm doing the work that I wanna do that I think is good work for myself and for my community. And if it goes beyond that, that's great. But I'm not sitting here being a careerist. I'm not about that. And I'm not competing with anyone in this space. What I want to do, though, is I want to see more acknowledgement, like the kind of acknowledgements that we are continually recognizing that it's a big part of how we go forward. And so we acknowledge all the people as much as we possibly can. Obviously, I remember Rebecca Belmore coming here and doing a performance, and the entire performance was thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and you know, I just thought that gratitude, that expression, was like just so powerful. And she came out of a limousine with a red carpet, rolled out to the billboard that we, as a community, had collaboratively created to support her to how we actually did this action as activists to support her and brought her to London. And, and it sort of spilled out in different ways. Um, and it was like a very big controversial thing. And it was all about money. It was all about the horror of getting that from the artist, the dealer getting that from the artist, and all this really negative stuff. So. This is a different thing going on here. In my mind, this is like a huge thing that has shifted the terrain in the way that we, in terms of methods, go forward. And I totally, you know, I love the fact that you raised the issue of the publications and the archive, because that's what the radical artifact discussion is all about. How do we publish? How do we protect the archive? How do we recognize all the things that are significant at a particular moment in time. And, you know, so, you know, we look over here at Museum London, they have the Stay Safe, the recognition that, yes, we're going to collect at this period in time of what is happening to us in, and the pandemic. Um, so I think these are definitely steps that recognize that there's an urgent situation going on, and there are ways that art plays a really important part in that, and art and culture in general. I'm speaking in an interdisciplinary way. I don't think, uh, I'm not part of those people who say art is not, cannot make change happen. Like, we can't, we can't transform the negative into a positive. 
uh-uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not of that thinking at all. I have a, uh, I've been working for so many decades now that I believe that our collective work together has actually had a very powerful impact on the thinking of a younger generation. And I see that happening as people gather and, uh, you know, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Greta and uh, her uh, movement to uh, raise the issue of climate crisis and what that did. And so that's what that mosaic was about, to sort of honor this young woman at that time and say, you know, I'm with you. I'm marching with you. I'm on the ground with you. I, and that's what that particular work is about. So I'll pass it on to you, Sharmista. It's great to hear, and it's, yeah, it's making me think uh, all the readings we got, you know, in the beginning of the project. Yes, and Greta's, yeah. one of the texts was on Greta's active. Uh, and that was the time I think she was doing her, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. It's, it's great to uh, hear three of you. And I would like to say, like, uh, in terms of uh, women and colonial, colonialism, uh, I would to add into, from a perspective of my, again, like, lived experience and uh, the Baradian thought of uh, interaction, like, when we do things, we and add a meaning already when, an object that it has its own meaning. And we kind of make that object active while creating or adding or, you know, in that process. And I, I kind of like that concept and try to think the whole embroidery technique that I'm kind of bringing or keeping it in my primary tool in my practice that how in colonial, uh, when India had its like almost 200 years history and how, uh, women had that embroidery or making a kantha, which is like a community, and they, they can get that time to talk about their life beyond their you know everyday work. And I just felt like that time they felt more uh, vocal, more um, like uh, more sp spoken about their views, their values, and with certain community, like a conference, a small, you know, and it's like a big, piece of a uh, blanket, basically. So I just feel like those are uh, maybe, again, I'm trying to see or re-embodiment those uh, existing concept or the object in my practice and trying to see through some contemporary views, like how I can take something uh, which is running there for hundreds of years. And then I studied in a school which was uh, established by a British uh, economist in Calcutta in 1840s. And I was studying when they celebrated 150 years old uh, age. And the embroidery was a compulsory education that I had to have. And that was uh, meant for, and that was one of the first school for women's education in Calcutta, um, initiated by a Britishers there. So I don't know if it has been changed now or not, but uh, that knowledge I'm still basically using in, in here. So I'm just thinking, what is going on? You know, am I adding something, or am I questioning that, or is it like I'm carrying a past that my ancestors, my grandmothers did? Uh, so uh, I see women coloni colonialism through maybe embroidery and how I can bring it and raise some issues or uh, some more uh, relevant contemporary concern or perspective. Like when I'm talking about taking a thread and it's gone, you know, from the work. What does that bring uh, to an um, artist who creates it or who somebody whom I don't know, maybe, who is possessing some of it? So is it bringing a relationship? Is, uh, is that, again, uh, yeah, those inter interconnection. I, I kind of like that whole idea of uh, interaction uh, while creating from a perspective of uh, an artist or practitioner. Yeah, so women and colonialism is that way in my practice. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, Sharmista. I'm going to go back to a part of your, the, the first part of your response where you talked about that notion of women gathering within a system in, in order to both work but be together and communicate and, and have this uh, community. And so that's going to bridge us into the second question. And I'm only going to ask the second question and then I think we're going to open it up. But it's a, it's a juicy question. And it's... Um, <laughs> How 
did or does, my thinking is does, uh, colonialism mediate questions of silence and agency? And how do you as artists respond to those questions around silence and agency within the context of both colonial histories but ongoing colonialism? A little question. <laughs> uh, how do we create capacity? Silence. Shut up. <laughs> The past three years of the pandemic have created a big silence. And I, someone, I didn't make this up, someone said this, and I really liked it, that uh, this three-year silence was the silence that allowed people to finally listen to the Native people. It created capacity. And for me, that, that relationship then to silence is, I can see it as a, a place of strength. Where we're talking about uh, gardens yesterday, we're talking about the goldenrod and how those are, um, you know, those those native plants are pulling the toxins out of that area in the coves. Our silence allows us to sit and pull toxins out of our coves. So that's how I relate to silence from a position of strength. Um, how I relate to silence is, um, I mean, a few things, like there's like, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of that Oprah meme where it's like, were you silent or were you silenced? If you don't know, <laughs> you should look it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, but it felt, no, it's actually so relevant. Um, uh, I think of it in kind of systemic terms, like wa ways in which you might be systemically gaslit or you might cite it, sort of self-gaslight. I think of one of my favorite texts of all time, The Transformation of Silence um, into Power by Audre Lorde, um, iconic black queer feminist um, poet writer. Um, I also think a lot about, um, I mean, I think all of the artists here in some form or another, um, self-articulation is a very important thing that's happening in the work. Um, and I think of, when I think of the multitude of ways in which one can be um, oppressed or pushed to the margins, you know, I think of um, the ways in which um, misogynoir, um, which is um, misogyny and noir as in black, it's a mixture of anti-black racism with misogyny, um, a term coined by um, Moira Bailey. Um, I will never <laughs> claim that as my term, but when I'm I'm working against that, then there's sort of um, ableism and other things that you know. If I'm speaking from my specific vantage point, um, so you know, there's such a short history of self-articulation, particularly, especially so for um, Black, Indigenous, um, and raci other racialized artists um, in terms of image making and in the kind of greater art history kind of canon. Um, so, you know, even if we see our lives as documented, we're often nameless or it's some derogatory orientalist, um, anti-black term that's being used. The images are often violent. They're, you know, often it's, um, you know, uh, it's like of a uh, indigenous person anywhere, like in Africa, the continent here, you know, being the like on the losing end of some violent historical depiction, right? So I think it's very important like part, sometimes just doing the work that is enough and quite empowering because it's our stories and our own voices um, and telling the truth, right? Um, so yeah, that's what I'll say about that. That's, that's great. I mean, I think that um, speaking in public is breaking that silence. And as, as you know, many of us, um, you know, have a lot of experience doing that it really doesn't change the nature of, of the need to speak in public about issues that are really important, despite the fact that they might be really difficult issues um, to raise. And um, it takes, like, I, I, I know I've said it so many times, like it takes the right person in the right place at the right time um, to help make different radical moves happen. Um, and I've been really fortunate in my life that there have been people like that who have spoken up and said, 
good things about the political positions that I have taken, where they're in encountering, encounter to, I mean, the negative things that try to interfere or disrupt, you know, in, in a way so that you are not heard. So, I mean, I think that there is a recognition on my part that the largeness of the people who uh, whose voices speak in a way very, very courageously um, against a lot of the hurtful and awful, um, not only the language, obviously, but the conditions um, of injustice in the world. So how we move towards a more equitable world, a more just world, obviously, is something that we are all, I think, in this room very passionate about. And um, I think I was very fortunate that I was raised with activist parents, that, you know, this, this was definitely a part of where we came to understand our relationship to this country and where we were living in London, Ontario, and how all of that came about. And so some of you who were here yesterday heard my brother speak about Salah. He spoke about um, my maternal grandfather and his journey. And I'm pretty, you know, like a lot of people say, oh, I can't do that work because I don't have the documented narrative. It's not in the archive. But we have the oral history. We have the stories that have been told to us by our families. In my case, I spent a lot of my time um, studying outside of Canada. While my relatives in Lebanon and Syria were coming to North America. So I was going like, when are we going? <laughs> when are we going to see this village that you are from? Where am I, how am I going to learn about this? And so finally they just said, okay, you go. You go, you go find it. You go find out, you, you'll find it. But what happened was I actually only got as far as Rome, which is pretty far uh, <laughs> for a teenager at that time. And I ended up staying in Rome for a period of time. Because of the disruptions that were happening in, in the region, my parents said, oh, come back. Don't go to the Middle East, come back. And I said, no, no, I'm this far, I'm going. And I was really lucky that I went. It was 67, 68 radical, radical years that were happening. And so like, I feel I'm part of that generation. They spoke loud and clear, and they were all over Europe, all over the Middle East, all over Mexico, Latin America. Activists were up on the, out on the street doing everything they could to disrupt and change the autocratic systems, the military regimes, everything that was causing all this suffering. And it was, a, I still, I believe that that was a groundbreaking moment, 1968. I came back to Canada, but in the period that I was gone in those two years, I learned so much from my elders that were alive still in the village and many of them had come to that village from places that no one would imagine that they would end up in that particular village married into our family. And how did this, this, this mix of people come together? Um, people who journeyed to North America, then returned to Lebanon, all kinds of mix of, of concepts and, and change. And so actually those villages, in my mind, were the real place that I learned because they shared their knowledge. Those women sitting on the roof, pressing <laughs> the figs to dry in the sun was a very, very important moment for me. The physical moment, the relationship to food, the harvesting, all of that. So with this project that Patrick and Jeff have put together and all the artists, I mean, it, it took me back into a lot of the um, you know, ongoing practices, but also the really fundamental um, relationships that I felt were a big part of my own history. And obviously, my, my relationship with Ron and his garden here and the relationship with the institution, which is a really interesting one to examine, but we don't have time to do it. But one day we will, because I think it's really important to look back at that histories, those histories and the people who built the institutions and how the institution responded to the notion that these places are part are, are here for us. 
They're, they're here for us, like to come to the garden, to come, to come to the institution, to come to the university, to do that. We're not slumming. Like, we're here for a reason. And I think that, that a lot of um, the divide that is typically referred to, um, often here in London, the town in the gown, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, look at all the different activities that have been generated between and across communities through this project, through, I think, Embassy Cultural House being a part of that, through all the different communities that came together yesterday, talking about the coast, um, all, all of the projects. Uh, the uh, project that Tom Cole uh, is involved in, um, that was so important. And I remember, Tom, when you did that project about the, the river and the water, and we said, when are we going to start calling this the Deshkan Zibi? And you said, it might take five years. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll be quick on silence, the idea. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, again, like, uh, as you said, from there, um, the women were, uh, maybe they didn't have chance to publish at that time. So they documented the observation about the happenings on Kanta through embroidery. Like, there are Britishers, there are celebration, cultural celebration. So it was, I feel like, it's was also language that what they couldn't speak in public, but they did it in a domestic sphere. And kind of, uh, I feel they were vocal there. They were not very silent uh, when we see the images. And it's all in like Victoria and Albert Museum and all other popular museums that you can see and how they represented their views through that form as a community. And, and probably beyond those images they talked, uh, and those were not there. So, yeah, for me, women, silence, and uh, it's that, yeah, the medium, the representation, the work of art, uh, for me, it's like, yeah, again, it's like a archive uh, of what they did, yeah. mm -hmm. beyond text through image skills. Shameless plug for the catalog, Sharmista unpacks this history of Caligat painting as a, a kind of alternative uh, colonial history uh, in the catalog. So I highly recommend taking a look at that conversation. Do you feel like we have maybe time for one or two questions? So I'm going to come to anybody who might have a question so that you can get onto the mic. Do we have any questions? Oh, perfect. Okay. Stand by. <laughs> Um, it's not necessarily a question. I just wanted to bring into awareness, especially with the conversation that we're just having, that safe space right now is having a gathering as well, too, and they're welcoming everyone into their space, and that's happening at the same time that we're having this. And so safe space is the um, space here for sex workers in our city, and it's led by Jenna Rose Sands. So I just want to welcome that into this conversation and space as well too. And I stopped by there on my way here today and told them that, that I was going to bring them into this space. So I'm doing so. Thank you so Thank much. You. For Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up this panel? I'll do my seven seconds of awkward silence. This is more of a question geared towards Katie. Um, I really um, admired when you were talking about um, this shift in your work that is turning towards Indigenous joy. And um, I know that you did the project uh, Mushhole uh, two years ago. So I was wondering if you've kind of entered into that space of joy yet, or you're still kind of shifting. <laughs> uh, that's an awesome question. Um, can you ever fully be in a place of joy while living a very oppressed existence? No, but I, I think that the, uh, it's important to share that message. So uh, I try to find little joy. I mean, <laughs> probably uh, everybody uh, just trying to find little tiny bits of joy here and then there, um, especially though tied to uh, my personal indigenous existence and the 
uh, 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 uh. There's this uh, uh, term of, you know, there's the 60s scoop, but then there's a millennial scoop. And I'm part of the millennial scoop. So uh, I grew up in foster home, very, very disconnected and feeling a lot of guilt about my uh, indigenous um, ness. <laughs> and I stayed away from it for so long. And I just didn't even, it wasn't relevant. And I didn't even want to mention it at all. And in the, the last few years, especially, I may, I may put a marker of maybe six years, the reclamation of Indigenous joy has helped me identify and start to work through a lot of the intergenerational trauma associated with it. So um, yes and no. But I hope that uh, in the very future, the uh, visual land acknowledgements that come out, uh, maybe I should revisit that work at the Grand Theatre at this point. But uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thank you for that response, Katie. I think that's a good note to end the panel on. So I'll ask you all to help me thank everyone for their contributions. Today.